Hey everybody, welcome to One More Round with Josh Norris. I'm excited to have our guest here, Wendy Hernandez. Uh, we have uh, known each other a long time. Just a quick bio on Wendy. So she's an Arizona native. She went to Notre Dame Law School, has been practicing law for 25 years. She's a managing attorney and CEO of Hernandez Family Law, founder of Command the Courtroom. She's got over a million views on YouTube. She's also a jeweler, a mother, and a wife. You can find her online at hernandezfirm.com commandthecourtroom.com, and of course on YouTube. Um, before we get started, if you guys like what you hear today, share it, put a comment in, and uh, make sure to like our page. Wendy, welcome. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate you having me. It's been forever since we've been together in person. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we see each other every two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Because we've done marketing and um, for your law firm for a long time, so we have our weekly check-in, but it's been through Google Meet, I think, for years. It has been. It yeah, has been. So. I think when was the last time I saw you in person? I have no idea. I mean, it was before the pandemic started. Holy so, smokes. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I guess I didn't realize since we do talk so yeah, often. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like yesterday since I've seen you. Awesome, yeah. So I thought today we'd just talk a little bit about your story. Um, okay. You're an Arizona native. You're from Baghdad, right? Correct, yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And yeah. What, what made you want to get into law? law? So, um, well, so I was raised in Baghdad, Arizona, which is a copper mining town mm -hmm. in northern Arizona. And my dad was a miner. His dad was a miner. My mom's dad was a miner. I came from a family of blue-collar workers. Same. Uh, you did, too? Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, we, uh, Marinci mine. So my, <gasps> grand, my dad, grandfather, and great-grandfather all worked in the mine. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we have that in common, then. Yeah. Copper mining kids. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I knew that I wanted to leave Baghdad. Um, and my mom and dad were really good about encouraging us to, you know, branch out and explore something outside of mining. Mining's hard work, as you know, yes. right? Um, and so they always said, you should go to college. And at some point, like when I was 12, I think, I, I just had this awareness that I wanted to be a lawyer. I don't know where it came from. You know, I think maybe some people call that a calling. Mm -hmm. But I just, I just knew I wanted to be a lawyer. And from that point on, I devoted everything that I did towards that goal. Um, you know, I, I made sure to study hard, get good grades in school, and I just, you know, never had a doubt that I would become a lawyer. And that's what I worked towards, and it happened. Yeah, it's great. And you went to Notre Dame? I did. I went to Notre Dame Law School, so I did my undergraduate um, work at ASU. I got a communication degree there, and I applied to s several different schools coming out of ASU, including the in-state schools. Um, and I thought I'd take a chance and roll the dice and apply to some Ivy League schools. I didn't know yeah. what it you know, took to, to get into those. You know, so, you know, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, mm -hmm. and um, got rejected by those. I think I was waitlisted by Stanford, but Notre Dame, which is not considered Ivy League, but was a, a highly ranked school at that time, yeah. um, accepted me. And so I'm, I come from a Catholic background and always heard about the fighting Irish and the football. And I thought, hmm, Notre Dame, okay, let's do it. And I'd never even been east of New Mexico at that point, but I decided to go, which was a, a good decision. Absolutely, yeah. Well, it's one of the most historical colleges we have in, in all the United States. Yeah. And yeah, from a college football standpoint, I mean, it's probably the most popular uh, totally. with the stories. Did you get to go to the football games? Oh my gosh, all, all of them. I yeah. mean, that was huge. I, you know, and I don't know a lot of football uh, about it. I'll be the first to admit, like, I know basically you need to get a touchdown. You don't need to when you go to, to <laughs> yeah. a place like that. You know, but, um, you know, the, the tailgating was just unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like that mm -hmm. before then, and I haven't seen anything like it since then. I mean, just people would come from all over the United States and their big RVs and the spreads were unbelievable. They were out of this world and just people really got set up and it was a huge party for the entire football weekend, yeah. every weekend that there was a home game. I mean, and, you know, the um, games were fun. I was there when Rudy was filmed, if you've seen Rudy. Oh, yeah, I have. Um, really good movie. And I was in the um, stadium during one of the scenes that they were filming. You no know? kidding. Yeah, so that was... Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually one of my favorite football movies. It's a good movie. Yeah. Really good movie. So now, was that the first time you had been away from your parents? Yes. Um, it, well, you know, I'd been away from them when I left um, Baghdad to go to school at ASU. Oh, ASU, yeah. And I was, you know, so growing up in the small town, I was, we were very sheltered mm -hmm. um, and protected. There were only 2,000 people in the entire town 
And that was, you know, my dorm size at ASU was half that size when when I was a freshman. So um, when I went to ASU, I was very homesick, called my mom and dad every day for the first year just because I missed them so much. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think by the time I had gotten to be a senior at ASU, it was like I cut the cord finally (laughs) a little bit. (laughs) But then, you know, going across the country to Indiana, that was like another, that was like a different step. Like it's like, oh, I can't just drive home and see them. I have to wait till Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever. So I only saw them a couple times a year, and that was pretty difficult for me because I'm so attached to them even to this day. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, and then uh, so you graduated from Notre Dame. I took your bar exam, I believe, in 96, if I remember correctly. That's, yep. And then, uh, you know, how did you decide to go into family law? So, it, you know, family law was not an intentional decision. It was, I kind of evolved into family law. Um, and so I failed my first bar exam in 1995 mm-hmm. that I took. And, you know, I will say that. A lot of it had to do that with the fact that my head was not in the right place. Mm-hmm. Like I had broken up with the boyfriend. I was so upset about that. And that's what I was focused on, not on passing a bar. And I was just not in a good mindset. So I failed that bar exam in October that I took in October of 95. And um, so I had to, you know, pull myself up by the bootstraps and study and take another bar exam the following January. Mm-hmm. And... So between the time I failed and the, the, when I passed, um, I went to work at a temp agency mm-hmm. because I was not a lawyer. And I had to do paralegal work. I didn't have to. I, that's what I chose to do. Mm-hmm. Paralegal work, secretary work. And I learned from a lot of lawyers. And I stayed with a particular law firm for a year. They were awesome lawyers, like some of the best lawyers in town. And you know, it was all for a good reason because mm-hmm. I think that's what led me to open my practice. But... Before that, after I passed the bar exam, I went to work at the county attorney's office. So I worked for lawyers for a year as a temp, worked as a criminal prosecutor for three years. What was that like? Um, It was cool. I mean, it was really fun. Like, it was trial by fire. Yeah. Because, you know, we got training, which was awesome, and the training was ongoing. But they just kind of threw you in and didn't matter. You know, you're talking about criminal offenses. You know, people would think you'd require a ton of training. Like, I didn't have a ton of training. I just started doing all the trials Mm -hmm. because that was my job. And I did, I don't know how many trials I did, but it was so many. And they ranged from possession of marijuana and traffic tickets to murder cases. And, you know, what I learned about, I learned a lot about people um, doing criminal law. Um, you know, and I think I learned even more becoming a defense attorney and I became a defense attorney after three years of prosecuting because Mm -hmm. working for the state at that time, I didn't make a lot of money. My parents were still helping me and I thought I need to, I need to figure this out because I had huge loan payments from law school Mm -hmm. and I thought I just not working. So that's, I decided to leave the prosecutor's office after three years, which I made a commitment to do three years. I did three years. And I opened up a defense practice, criminal defense. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it really got interesting for me in terms of the work, the criminal defense work, because I was then having to go into jails and meet with my clients. That was a new experience. Um, And that was part of my daily routine, was going to the jails and doing jail visits. What I learned was that, you know, most people just really wanted to be heard. They wanted to be listened to. They wanted to tell their story. Mm -hmm. Um, There was only a couple of people who, you know, really didn't acknowledge or take responsibility. Most people said, hey, yeah, you know, this was the role that I had and this is what happened. This is the backstory. And I just, you know, I became less judgmental. As a prosecutor, I was pretty judgmental, I think, thinking, oh, these people are bad, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> these criminals are bad. They're mm-hmm. criminals. As a defense attorney, I learned that there are people who have a story and maybe grew up and, you know, didn't have the best circumstances, didn't have the privileges that I had. And so they are in a situation, you know, that they're responsible for, but, you know, life circumstances kind of led them there. So that was really good to prepare me for, I think, family law and being a good listener, which is what I have to do most of the day, every yeah. day now. Well, and it's interesting. So you're talking about you know people that have obviously they've committed a crime, 
Uh, they made a mistake. I mean, the reality is, is I mean, I don't know about any of you guys. I've made some mistakes I could have gone to jail for. Oh, for sure. I just didn't. For I sure. didn't get caught. I it, was lucky. 100%. So, you know, anybody who wants to throw stones at somebody yeah. who's made a mistake, I mean, granted, some mistakes are bigger than others, but yeah. at the end of the day, everybody can, you know, needs proper defense. That's what our country is about. Totally. It's, you know, and it's a hard thing because, um, you know, a lot of times the people I was representing did it, so to speak. Yeah. You know, and so I had, and you know, my creativity expanded as a defense attorney too because I had to come up with creative arguments to try to exonerate my clients. You know, and there's rules. The system is based on rules. You know, a defendant's guilt has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So if I knew my client shot somebody mm -hmm. and killed somebody, I wouldn't get up there and say, they're innocent, they didn't do it. That's not the argument. The argument would be that the state hasn't met their burden of proof, so you can't find them guilty. There's mm -hmm. a certain standard that needs to be met and it wasn't met. So mm -hmm. under the rules of our state or our country, you can't find them guilty. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So that's kind yeah. of how I reconciled yeah. um, in a lot of cases. Was there any like one case that really stood out to you that like uh, you felt like you advanced in your career by getting through that? Um, you know, I, I don't know if it advanced my career, but the, the one case that stands out a lot to me was a multi-defendant case and a multi-defendant trial. And so there were four defendants and they were accused of executing, shooting a woman in a desert. Um, and the reason is, is because she, or was, because she, she was, uh, you know, involved in drugs. Mm -hmm and she wanted to get drugs, and she had bought drugs from these guys who were Mexican nationals, um, and she knew that they had drugs. Wherever they were, they stored them. But she didn't have money to get the drugs, so she kind of um, coordinated a robbery of their oh. place, and they found out about it. So then they kidnapped her and took her out into the desert and shot her. Um, and You know, my guy was a hardcore, <laughs> tough guy, a little bit scary, um, but you know, I learned because there was a, a prosecutor who was much senior to me and she, you know, I got to do a trial with her and I got to see what she did, how she cross-examined, how she was very assertive, you know, and she was powerful in the courtroom. So I learned a ton from her and then there were two other attorneys. So I learned from them as well. I think they had the same experience level, but it was nice to kind of have that team effort and not feel so alone and actually learn from someone more senior. And I think that was one of the last cases that I did before I left the prosecutor's office. My client was found guilty, as were all the others, yeah. <laughs> you know, but um, it was a, a sad and heavy duty case. I mean, there were, there was ballistics evidence involved and um, a lot of scientific evidence. There were pictures that were difficult to look at. It was it was hard. You, you know, I, I know a lot of attorneys. Um, I know you probably is one of the better ones as far as oh, our relationship and, and your, your career and what you've done. How do you manage the stress? How do you manage seeing some of that? Uh, because I can imagine being weighing on you. And I know we've talked a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, it's, you know, that has been an evolution too. Um, because I remember when I worked at the county attorney's office, you know, I'd be so tired at the end of every day, not just emotionally, but also physically. I remember my feet hurt a lot mm -hmm. when I started to wear, I was wearing high heels and walking around and I'd come home and I thought my feet are killing me. And I just lay on the bed and cry. A lot of times I feel like I hardly cry anymore. I used to cry all the time. Um, because it was just, I had a hard time. I was kind of a softy mm -hmm. based on the fact that I was so sheltered. Um, and then I feel like it's kind of like, you know, you just, you build up um, a, a callous. You know, I, I, I don't want to say that I'm calloused, but you just kind of start to get used to or just your threshold starts to, you know, get higher for handling really hard things because that's the only way that you can do it. And you know, now I don't cry a lot, you know, but I do manage, I, I do manage self-care a lot more. Mm -hmm. You know, I, now I, I meditate without fail every morning for at least 30 minutes, and that helps me get centered. Um, I work out, not every day like you, like I think you're on, I don't know what kind of streak you're on now, but. A little over three years. Yeah, it's awesome. Like, I wish crazy. I. crazy. Don't ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's awesome. But I, you know, I work out at least five days a week. Um, right. That's a great release of stress. Um, and, I, you know, I try to laugh. Like, I am kind of a serious person. I have a husband who's kind of not so serious and crazy, so he always keeps me laughing. Mm -hmm. I think laughter is important. But just doing those things to nourish my soul really helped me. And I can tell when I'm getting to a point like, okay, I'm not doing anybody good. I'm cranky. I'm angry. I'm not happy about doing these cases. And that's time to take a break. So it's important to realize for me what my limits are and when I'm ready to hit them mm -hmm. and when to put the brakes on. Yeah, I think that's a great advice for anybody in any career that's got stress because uh, you got to know what your triggers are and mm -hmm. you know if you're going down a bad path, yeah. all right, how do I step back? What can I do to alleviate some of that so I can get back on course? Because if you don't, burnout's a bad place to be. It is. It's, um, you know, at the end of last year, like I had some really hard cases in 2021 that you know, took a lot out of me. And plus I'm managing a business. Plus, you know, I have a 10 year old daughter. There's a lot going on. But at the end of last year, I got to that point, like to the edge. And I thought I need to stop right now. And I, I stopped taking cases because I had to for my own well-being, you know, for my family's emotional health. And that's not an easy thing for me to do because with you, I work a lot on getting cases and marketing. Right. So right. saying no is so hard. Yeah, it is. You, I've watched the evolution, though, of your career over the last eight years I've known you, and you've now got it in kind of what you talked about four or five years ago when you told me what your vision was mm -hmm. and wanting to kind of step back from doing all the cases but having, you know, attorneys that you manage, and you're, you know, pretty much there. It's, su it's super cool to watch because your Thanks. firm's thriving. Um, so you moved into family law. When did that happen? Okay, yeah, so that was, you know, I was doing, I did criminal defense for a long time. And it's hard to say because the criminal defense and the family kind of melded into each other um, naturally. A lot of my criminal clients. How does that? Yeah. So a lot of the criminal clients, like, so I'd represent them in their criminal cases. And then they'd say, hey, like, um, I'm getting a divorce. Or, hey, I just got this child support paperwork and I need to show up in court. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. And... I don't know why, but I decided to give it a try. I don't know what prompted me because I didn't know family law at all. Mm. And I started saying okay, and I learned how to do family law, honestly, by going to the self-help website for Maricopa County Superior Court. And I, I studied the forms and looked at the rules and went into court terrified sometimes because I really didn't know what I was doing. But then I learned it and I realized that um, I was probably better suited for the family law than I was for criminal law. You know, and there's so I decided at some point to just, I'm not doing criminal anymore. I'm only doing family. And so that's where I am right now mm -hmm. is 100% family law. Awesome. Uh, and how long have you had your own practice then? Since 99. 99. Wow. wow yeah. So you made that jump pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, I did. After the three years at the prosecutor's office, that's when I... The way I was able to leave the prosecutor's office was Maricopa County has contracts with uh, the state has contracts. So, and I don't know if it's this way now, but it was when, way back then. So I applied to get a contract to represent indigent defendants. Mm -hmm. And so for every case I'd get paid, depending on the level of the case, it could be 500 or $600 mm -hmm. for getting a case. And for serious cases, it was like $1,200. Mm -hmm. You know, it's crazy. Um, and, but I knew I could count on it. You know, I, I said to myself, if I can get at least five cases from the county or six cases from the county at five or six hundred dollars yeah. each, I can make it. And then I thought, and then I, I'll get private clients on top of it. So, you know, and that was a weird balance because sometimes you just get flooded with cases and you're doing all these cases yet you're spending way more time than you're actually kind of getting compensated for. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm doing a murder case for a couple grand, a murder case, yeah. which requires a ton. So, you know, at some point I thought, mm, I don't think that um, I can do the county contract anymore because it was, that was, I was approaching burnout there too. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what allowed me to get out because I knew I could count on some income. You know, and it's kind of, it's really cool to hear you, tell that story because you had to let go of that to be able to grow. Yes. Otherwise, you never wouldn't be able to grow. You wouldn't have had the time. Um, you ever heard the spider monkey? How do you catch a spider monkey? No. Yeah, so spider monkeys are 
look it up online. Uh, Zach, maybe he'll throw up a picture of one. Uh, but to catch them, they would take these uh, buckets that they could barely fit their hand in, and they would put um, peanuts in there. And the thing is, is they can get their hand in yeah. to grab the peanuts, but they can't get it out once they make a fist. And all they would have to do is just go out and pick them up. Oh. So it's one of those things where a lot of people don't realize that you got to let go of something uh, that will allow you to expand and go much further in your career. It sounds like that's what you did. It's yes, that's a hundred percent true, and that was scary. And you know, one person really helped me with that. And I will, I did, I did quote life or business coaching before it was the thing. Like mm -hmm. I think, like it's such a big thing now. Mm -hmm. But I did that probably you know, 15, 16 years ago, I had a life coach and he had bought and sold bunches of businesses and he was a multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. uh, and he really held my feet to the fire. He held me accountable every week. I went to see him and he would charge me at some point. He started making me pay him more money if I didn't honor my promises to him. And, you know, and the promises that he, like, I don't want to say pushed me, like, assertively nudged me to make were mm -hmm. all in my like best interest right but they were not easy promises to make and so I think to for him to get me from this contract is no longer serving you know my overall well-being to quitting the contract it took a little bit of time it mm -hmm. wasn't overnight but like that was the best thing that could have happened and you know there wasn't any interruption in my getting clients I think mm -hmm. like clearing that and letting somebody else who needed a contract to get one and letting myself have space allowed more people really to come to my private practice side. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. And it, um, did it grow pretty quickly? Did, were you doing a lot of word of mouth? How'd you market in the beginning? <laughs> yellow pages. <laughs> like, yellow pages. Do you remember the I yellow do. pages? <laughs> and um, yeah, I'd buy, but you know, I never could afford back then to buy anything major in the yellow pages, it was just like a little app, you know, cause there was these big, these guys who had huge advertising budgets. What was a full page back then? Oh, I don't know. I feel like it was still, you know, well, maybe it was hundreds or thousands a month. I don't know, you know, a thousand or two. I don't know. It just was a lot to me. <laughs> I heard a story recently and it was somebody that was in Washington back in the, in talking about the yellow pages and the plumber, they were talking about a $10,000 a year. A year. Uh, yeah, for like one full page, oh, like wow. that's just in there. Yeah, it's which, crazy. Yeah, it's you a, know. Yeah. Or no, I'm sorry, ten thousand a month. Oh, that's hard to believe. I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah. But yeah, I that mean, was the only way to advertise back that, then. That was the only way to advertise, and and then, God, I don't know when it was. Because another thing, Stephen, my coach back then, um, kind of forced me to do. I say that with love. Mm -hmm. What? So I was always rented space from other attorneys who had an office. Mm -hmm. And at some point he said, you need your own space. Like no more of this renting space business. You're renting, you're leasing a space. Here's the name of it, uh, an agent, a commercial real estate agent. Go out with him and find a space. I'm like, okay. So I did. And it was around that time that I was approached by a guy who's a marketing guy. Um, and he's like, yeah, I want to do a, this thing called a website for you. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I did it, and I don't even know why, but I did it. And that's how I got the HernandezFirm.com, and I've had it for years mm -hmm. since then. It's a good domain. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you got your website going, and then uh, I guess we met quite a bit later. So eight years ago would have been 2014. Something Sound like that. About right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We met uh, through Shannon, your brother. Yep. yep. Through uh, Shannon, who uh, one of my favorite people. Yep. Yeah. And I think we were doing some marketing stuff together, and he had mentioned that you were with Find Law, I believe, at the exactly. time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And today, when I hear that, like that's a, I, it's like hearing money because, like, cool. I know that I can crush you guys because you're terrible and totally. you just rake people over the coals. Totally. That's uh, why I wanted to switch. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Shannon linked us up because Shannon found out how much they were charging me. And what happened is I got dinged by Google mm -hmm. during some update or something because what happened was Fine Law was publishing identical contact content on my site and other lawyers' sites. So then I got uh, penalized. Yep. Yeah, duplicate content. That's a yeah. big no-no in the SEO world. Exactly. Yeah. And I was paying them thousands every month, like thousands and thousands. And Shannon's like, mm -mm, no, nope, it's got to stop. Yeah. So. Well, I'm certainly happy you made that change because I think we've 
helped and it's been yes. cool because we've always uh, been conversational too about the marketing. It's not like uh, we just, it's a set it and forget it. You know, right. we meet every two weeks. So we yep. talk about how things are going, how the phone calls are. Yep. Um, are you seeing any more of one type? How are, are your attorneys busy? Yep. You know, and by getting that feedback, we, we talk about, okay, do we need to increase budget? Do we need to take budget down? Yep. Um, and I think that's important for a lot of companies like CEOs when they're working with an outside marketing company to have those conversations because totally. if you don't, then it's just all guesswork. Agree. And it's not a set it and forget it by any stretch of the imagination. I agree 100%. I feel like I love the strategy sessions that we have mm -hmm. about, you know, the website and growing it and the organic, you know, search results and the pay-per-click and, you know, it's a, it's a very alive thing kind mm -hmm. of changing, I mm -hmm. feel like, every month, which is part of the reason it's successful because we don't just set it and forget it. Yep, absolutely. And as you continue to add more attorneys, you know, we just have those conversations. It's, yeah. it's a scalable thing. Which exactly. Nice. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So you've done great, a great job for us with the website. And I, it was scary at first because, and I don't even remember how I unhooked. Like, I think I paid some money to find law to get out of it because I was like, I need to get out of it. Probably. Yeah. And then um, we kind of re had to rebuild things, I remember. And re, I don't even know what the terminology is, but there was like a, a, a little bit of time where I saw even more of a dip mm -hmm. until we got up and running. That was scary, but then it allowed us to grow even more with me having a lot of control over what I was writing and putting out there. Yeah, well, and that was one thing. So Matt, you know, has always handled the SEO. He was actually on the show a little, a few weeks ago. And I mean, just did a really good job of cleaning up all their mess, yeah. uh, taking away all the duplicate content. Yep. You did an excellent job of writing constant um, content. I mean, you yeah. had more content than most lawyers put out there, certainly that you, you were personally doing, yeah. which, which helped. So yeah. yeah, and then we kind of hockey sticked up yeah. as far as like what you rank for and all that. Totally. Yep. Um, so then you got, I know you got into YouTube Mm -hmm. Three, four, five years ago. Something like that, yeah. I was looking at this today actually before you came in. I yeah. checked periodically, but I mean, you really have had a ton of views on there. Yeah. Like one of them had 198,000 yeah. views. Yeah. So, yeah. what was that like? Were you comfortable uh, on video in the beginning, or how'd you get started no. doing that? <laughs> I was not at all. And it would take me like two hours to do a three minute video because I just hated everyone and would re-record so but you know i started it because when i was in the family law courtrooms like 80 percent of family law participants are unrepresented so a lot of the people i go up against in the courtroom didn't have attorneys and what i saw on the other side of the room was people like freezing up freaking out getting paralyzed by fear not knowing what to say and just choking not giving the judge the information that needed to be heard so the judge could make the best decision for the family, which is truly what I want, mm -hmm. really, regardless of who I represent, like especially if there's kids involved. And I just didn't think that was right. Like, and I felt like there's so many people who cannot afford attorneys. I want to empower them as much as I can to get some knowledge so they're not so lost and not knowing what to do. So I, I decided to just start putting these little videos up on YouTube. I didn't have like some goal of earning a living off my YouTube videos. I just wanted to help people. And once a week, I just would post some short tip or I'm facing this situation in the courtroom where I saw this happen today, like, don't let this be you. You know, and I really, they were things that I thought people would want to know, questions that they had. Mm -hmm. And it, for me then, it was like, I said it and forget it. I just do the video and that was it. And then one day I was having lunch with Shannon and I don't know how much later it was, maybe a year later and he's like, you have, like so many thousands of views on your channel. Did you know that? And I didn't, I was like, what? So that's when I started getting a little more intentional about YouTube and a little more serious and putting more thought into things. And um, it was hard to be on camera at first. And some of my early videos, like I cringe when I look at them mm -hmm. because it's me like holding a camera, a phone camera and like it's shaking, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they're horrible in terms of probably the quality, but the information is there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important thing, like people who's considering, or who are considering doing video or YouTube, you know, or any other medium like TikTok, which I know nothing about. I mean, I think it's just doing it because there's always a bad period. You're mm -hmm. always learning in the beginning and it's not gonna be great, but before you can be good, you have to be bad 
at anything you do. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, and then just getting started and being consistent with it, which you did. Yeah. Um, but I like when you said you got more intentional about it. So what were some of the things that you, when you got more intentional, that you started doing that uh, helped expand the audience and the reach? Yeah, so, um, well, um, I started nurturing my followers a little more and, um, you know, sending emails to them, asking what their questions were. So when I decided to, to hire a lady who's awesome at her job to optimize the YouTube channel, that's really when it started taking off mm -hmm. um, because we were able to reach people who wouldn't normally be able to find us you know, through search and recommended videos and things like that. Um, another thing that I did that helped the channel grow, in my opinion, was just increasing my engagement with the followers. And there was a couple of years that I did live streams once a week, mm -hmm. um, you know, where um, I did interviews or I may ask question, may have asked que answered questions that people submitted through a form. And I got to interact with people on YouTube every week and they chat with me and that was fun. I mean, you know, I've been on live streams and, and somebody, well, even my brother, when he's doing like a Facebook live feed and says, hey, I see my sister on here. It's like, oh, awesome, mm -hmm. you know? And it yeah. makes people feel special engaging with them. But, you know, I got to chat with people who live in Australia, in England, all over the world, which is cool that, you know, to see that the work is helping people. but. Yeah, really focusing on the channel, being continuing to be consistent about it, you know, getting a good lead magnet in that YouTube description and optimizing the description so people can find you and take advantage of the offerings. Mm -hmm. You know, that helped that helped increase the products. I have some products that people can buy. Like all the information is out there on the YouTube channel. There's over 200 videos, but it's not in order. If somebody wants the same info, but in order in an organized fashion with worksheets, then they can buy a program too. Oh, where would they buy that at? At commandthecourtroom.com. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, if you guys want to represent yourself, I recommend you go there. <laughs> yep. um, as far as your other services, uh, how do they go about contacting you uh, and getting representation from an attorney? Yep. So if uh, I'm only licensed in the state of Arizona, so I can represent people and the lawyers at my firm can represent people in Arizona. I think one lawyer's um, licensed in Washington state and one's also licensed in Virginia. But yeah, go to hernandezfirm.com. Uh, There's a form that you helped us set up where people can type in and contact us or they can call the number and get a consultation set up. So that's another way. Awesome. Yep. Cool. So on top of all that, and I got to bring this up because it's really cool. <laughs> You've been doing it for a few years. You, you make jewelry. Yes. Uh, what got you into that? I mean, you make some cool stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> what got me into that? You know, I took a jewelry class. I don't know why, and my daughter was young still. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I thought I had time to do any kind of extracurricular class, but I did. I took a little class in, in Phoenix, and it immediately addicted me. Um, and it was a silversmithing course, and then I took another course and another course, and I couldn't set down the torch. Like, I work with the torch, and I solder, and I create cool stuff from flat pieces of... Of silver mm -hmm. um, and I've worked with gold a little bit but you know that is for me a good outlet too like we were talking about burnout earlier and self-care um, doing my jewelry is kind of that special place for me like where I'm in a state of flow and time um, kind of flies by like nothing I can be in there for hours and it feels like 10 minutes and I think like I solve a little a lot of problems mm -hmm. that I have in my work by doing the jewelry because it's just quiet and I think and let your mind kind of be in a different place mm -hmm. as you're focused on something else. Exactly. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, do you sell it or? Here and there I do. <laughs> um, you know, um, I've released a couple of collections, but, um, I, you know, it's, it's like, it's fun for me. And I don't want to put so much pressure on myself to produce mm -hmm. inventory that it does, it becomes unfun. So because I have my full-time work, like there's just, I can't do it enough to produce enough inventory to regularly sell. But I might, you know, make a piece and I post it because I'm proud of it. And if somebody says I want to buy it and if I don't want to keep it, then I'll say, sure, you can buy it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. If um, you ever go deeper into that, we'll have to have you back on. That'd be cool. We'll display some of the jewelry. Yeah, um, I'd love to. But yeah, no, thanks so much for coming on today. It's, uh, I hope, I'm sure people got a lot of good stuff, you know, you're very interesting and uh, you're 
You're one of the smartest people I know, so Aww. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Josh. Well, thanks for having me here. Absolutely. I feel honored to be here. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Well, if you enjoyed this, share the show. Uh, like, comment. You know, we appreciate it. Take care. We'll see you next week.